here with Michael Cooley. Michael, I'm so looking forward for this interview. I've been wanting to talk to you about your life's work and everything you've written and your book and all the amazing things you've done leading companies uh, and, and organizations and inspiring so many people all over the country. So just really looking forward to this, man. Uh, if you just start giving us a little bit about your background, that would be great. Uh, so, Andres, thank thank you for having me on uh, again. It's it's an honor, it's a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And I also appreciate everything that you do, and uh, I'm I'm glad I could be a part of the call today. So, just a little bit on my background. Um, again, where do I start, Andres? So, if I start from the beginning, uh, I start I start from growing up in in two separate families. Right, my uh, my mother and father were separated, like many many people they got divorced and so i spent half my time up in st louis and another half of my time uh down in texas where my uh, where my father moved to and as a part of that my 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 school year was going to texas for the first time and my dad remarried and as a part of that my uh, i had a new family a stepmother and two stepbrothers that were four and five years older than my little brother and me. And so when we all got together, this family, I was really excited about uh, as a little kid, I was four or five years old, my earliest memories. And I remember meeting my new family. My father would go to work. And while my father was work, we would play and be doing the same things we'd be doing with our stepbrothers, just having fun out in the yard. And my stepmother would come out, and as a, as a result of um, her frustration or anger about my brother and I being a part of the family now, uh, I found myself under abuse uh, with my stepmother, who would, we would be doing the same things as my, my, step, my stepbrothers were doing, and she would come out and she would do something like, break a rose bush off a branch and take all the leaves and roses off of it. And then just grab my little brother and me in my shorts. And she would, you know, beat us with this rose bush branch. And as a result, our legs would start bleeding. We'd be screaming bloody murder. And she would grab us and say, if you continue to yell, it was going to get worse. And it did for the next decade my stepmother and stepbrothers joined in behind the scenes abused my little brother and me until i was 15 years old at the same time uh we would go stay with my mother during the summer and my mm -hmm. mother um had her own issues where uh it turns out my mother was a raging alcoholic and she would drink uh, excessively she would drink a fifth of whiskey a day and my little brother and me you couldn't even tell she was uh, she was um, uh, drunk right but she had been drinking all day and she would be completely loaded we'd wake up and she'd take us to the bars in the morning we'd be there all day she would meet different men and bring them home she was married some nine times and so my brother and I were also abused on my mother's side by my mother and my different stepfathers along the way. So my growing up years as a kid was spent bouncing back be between these two states, being abused by my step family or by my mother and my stepfathers. And that went on until a point where the rage started building up into me, where I reached a point that, you know, I say, what happens when you beat a caged animal, animal for years? They either, one, curl up in the corner and die, or they lash out and attack. And in my case, I did the latter. And my, my stepmother went to hit me one day, and I stopped her from hitting me. And I said, it's going to end now. So at 15 years old, I left home. And, I've, and I never went back and lived it any of my families again. So I was on my own at 15, hitchhiked all over the country, ended up finding a new family in St. Louis. And this family was a, a street gang. 
and a bunch of social misfits, just like I was. And we would live on the streets, live in broken down apartments, live in the basements of, of other people's homes. And, and we just lived on the street. We began gang banging and then got in trouble with alcohol and drugs and, and um, crime. And next thing I know, I'm in, in and out of detention and then eventually involved with burglaries and resisting arrest and in and out of jail. So I'm now waking up and I'm in my 20s and living, um, uh, living basically had removed myself from the gang, was all alone, living in a broken down car, staying in a car, rest, uh, a car stop, getting cleaned up in the car stop, trying to fix my car to get me around town, had no, nobody wanted anything to do with me. This was my rock bottom. This was the rock bottom from the streets part. So the first half of my life, I had reached rock bottom, didn't know where to turn, had nobody to turn to. There, I had no education on anything, any direction I could go where I could go. And that is what I thought my life was going to be, that that was going to be the end of my life. And now I'm in my mid twenties with nothing or no one to turn to. So that's the, the, the first half of my life and the first half of rock bottom. So I don't know if you have any questions around that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, where do I start, man? Wow. I mean, I knew some of your, your, your story and, and he's, I've always, I've always shared to, I share your story all the time, Michael. I, I, I do. I mean, in, in your book and to patients that are in these very crazy situations. And I always, you know, wonder how is it when you got to that moment that where is like, where I guess one rock bottom, I guess is, is, is something that we say, but it was probably many rock bottoms that you hit one after another one. You know, we do not, I mean, we all have them in a, in a certain way, but yours is, is just incredible. And so where did you start noticing? Um, when did you start noticing something happened with the, with the computer? But where, when did you start noticing that there is something completely that this is not you maybe, or that this is not like how you, that there's more there. Like when did you start kind of having those thoughts or did you always have those thoughts? Yeah. So, the, so that's a great question, Andreas. And what happened was, is, you know, that's probably the number one question I get asked is when did you hit rock bottom? And to your point, I hit rock bottom again and again and again. Um, when, there were times when I had just been in a gang fight and I was drunk and on drugs and pass out in the carpet. And I wake up the next day in my apartment laying in a pool of blood and vomit and not knowing how I got there. That's a rock bottom for me, right? In, 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 that, in that regard. Or when, I'm, when I have no place to stay and I'm sleeping in an alleyway in St. Louis with the freezing snow coming down and I'm sleeping in a doorway just to block the wind that's whistling through and sleeping in an alley hoping nobody know, sees me or knows who I am. Um, so there are several of those rock bottoms, but then to your ultimate point, when I hit that rock bottom of my car broke down in the middle of a, a road and I had everything I owned in two hefty bags and I threw it over my shoulder and I just started walking. I didn't know where I was going to end up going, but I just started walking. And, and as I did that, I said, this is not me. I'm more than this. Or, I know that I have something in me. This is not how my life should end. And so I talk about the point of coming to a crossroads in life where I go down the path that I've only ever known, which is drugs, alcohol, despair, incarceration, insanity, um, living off the government, uh, just, just, 
just nobody ever graduated from high school, much less college, that path? Or do I carve a new path where I start over as a new person and I start with a new beginning and I go and start over where I've never been before? And I just say, give me this opportunity. The next opportunity I get, I'm going to take absolute and complete advantage of it. And whoever takes a chance on me is going to get the most committed, loyal, dedicated person to the success of whatever that is for that person. So that's what ended up happening. And I ended up hitchhiking, ended up finding myself in Dallas. And in Dallas is where I answered a little ad in the newspaper wow. uh, for a mailroom assistant. And today, a lot of people won't know we have a lot of mail things going on right now, but you used to have a job where you took mail that was delivered and put it into slots for offices. Today, I think we call that email. I don't think we even have mail rooms anymore. But uh, so that was my job. I made a little over eight dollars an hour and I started in this big office building and I didn't know anybody there. I didn't have any family around me, no friends. No, like I said, I was just starting over with this job and it was just an amazing connection that I had with this company. It was it was a CEO who branded the culture of this company in a way of caring for everybody selflessly. And he did some things that I just witnessed that I could not believe that I'd never seen in any people. So this was a fortune. This was a company that um, managed the, the businesses of fortune 500 financial institutions all your large banks and all that. And we did a service for them, consulting service. The CEO uh, was a gentleman that came in and he, we, we had the saving and loan crisis of the 90s, the early 90s. And I was working in the mailroom. I'd only been there a short period of time and he had to call everybody in. And he ended up laying off from 100 people down to about 14 people were left. And he called the remaining people into this office to tell them that he was, he had to lay off all of these families. And I could see the pain as he cried. He felt like he let everybody down, mm -hmm. but I was sitting there. I was so such an introvert and so intimidated by everybody around me. Again, I'm the lowly mailroom clerk. These are PhD master degrees, people that have ran banks and they just find out that they're, they're laid off. And I'm literally standing behind a curtain because I don't want anybody to see me because I want to be invisible. And when he started crying and I felt the pain that he felt for all of those employees, I came away from that curtain and I dedicated myself to say from this moment on, I am going to do everything I can to make this man and this company successful. I didn't know what I was going to do from the mailroom. And the fact that I didn't get laid off, I think it's because my salary was so low that um, they didn't even notice it on the, on the financials, but I dedicated myself to just, just, crawling, even though I have my own past to crawl out of, I was going to come away from that curtain and I was going to stand up front and I was going to start leading rather than standing in the background. So over the next 10 years working for that company, I went from the mailroom to senior vice president of operations for this company. Uh, we went from a $4 million company to a $40 million company. We went from being 14 people to being back over a hundred and international, right? And so um, it was just that, just an amazing culture that this man created. And to this day, his name was Robert Hall. Today, this man is a lifelong friend and mentor of mine. Wow. And, and, and that turned everything around for me 
Um, and then my career went on to where um, I always said to myself, you know, it, if I was, I learned from him in a way that I said, well, wow, if I could ever do this, I would want to do it the way this man did it as far as running a company. And then in 2006, I was recruited out of Dallas to Providence, Rhode Island to be the CEO of a medical records management company. And, and so I got that opportunity where um, I came in, relocated with my family. We built this company up. We went from a small local mom and pop company to becoming um, uh, nationwide. We had locations that were in Providence. I opened several locations in the Rhode Island area, opened locations in Orlando, Dallas, and Baltimore. Um, and then we were doing business all across the country from Alaska and, and we, we over tripled the size of the company in three short years. Um, and we built the company to the point that the owner wanted to sell it. So we sold the company. So it was, it was an awesome experience to, to be able to take and learn what I learned from the mail room to the boardroom and apply it with companies. Um, so, so that, that's, that's kind of the progression of how I climbed from rock bottom to do what I do from a business perspective. Wow, Michael, that's an amazing story. When you were in the, when that day happened, um, and then the subsequent days when, you know, now you have 14 employees, how was your job then? How, how did you start to, I imagine at that time, maybe you were not using anymore and, and maybe things were still changing or how was it that, how was your side, how was your inner talk? And then how was the things that you were doing exteriorly? Yeah. So, so, you know, because we had downsized so much, right. Um, and again, remember my job was the mail room at the time. Well, what we did was we created a set of training materials for the banks, right. And so we had an entire team that did that. I ended up moving from the mail room to heading up production, managing editors, managing word processors, managing print shop, managing the entire production of the training materials we used. And I went there to be head of production for, for this company action system. So from the mail room to head of production. And then, and then internally, it was, I kept applying that, that I was going to do whatever it takes to make this company successful. One of the examples came in the early days when we were really desperate. We couldn't make payroll. So at the time, the only way we could have made payroll was we had materials, training materials that we had to ship and we could bill for the materials that were shipping. So we ended up, so what happened is everybody else went home trying to figure out, and we're going to come in Monday to try to figure it out. I stayed from Friday to Sunday and shipped um, $100,000 in material. So to, to all the sites that needed it, so we could bill for that. So we had enough to put on payroll. And, and so that's some of the examples of, you know, just, giving it everything you got for the company. And then the great thing about it was the CEO knew I was at the office working the weekend doing that. And he drove up there and picked me up just to talk to me, just to see how I was doing. And it just felt incredible to have somebody you felt that cared for you. And so it made me care for the company. And, and it was just, uh, it, 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 there's just so many examples where that happened, where I felt now more than a part of a company. I felt a part of a movement. I felt a part of a family. Uh, I felt I had purpose. And, and that was the game changer for me. And there was no turning back because then I met my incredible wife. We had, we have two incredible kids and I just was, um, I just owed it to everybody who depended on me to to make this happen and and today i'm the senior vice president of a um 
of a $700 million um, healthcare services company where I am, so I'm responsible solely for 200 million of that revenue. And we have 2000 employees in my zone with families and eight vice presidents and 30 uh, regional managers and uh, over 11 different states who all have the, um, the task of coming in every day and dealing with what they deal with to do the job to serve patients. And then we're dealing with the COVID time. And I feel that they are, that they depend on me and I'm responsible to them to keep them safe, to allow them to make money, to go home to their families, to create opportunities for them to be safe and still um, make money to support their family. So um, all that I've learned from coming from rock bottom and everything that it took to climb out of it, I'm able to apply some of that today, the grit it takes, the heart it takes. Um, and, and I hope that I'm doing the job uh, of, the, of what the company wants me to do and the employees need me to do. And so right now we're maneuvering pretty well through these times as a company. And because uh, we've got a whole lot of people with rock bottom stories who have climbed out and they're giving it to the company. And so that's what, that's what I'm really excited about and really feel that this, this is my calling. Um, so back in, in 2011, I was, um, prior to that, I was, I was one day looking in the mirror and I'm saying, how did this happen? How did I move? from living in the streets with not a dime in my pocket and nobody wanted anything to do with me, having everything I need materially, financially, uh, family, loving family, uh, just having, having everything. I said, how did this happen for me? Um, and, and as I looked at my reflection, I, I, I thought about it and I, I said, there it is. The answer right there, because, there's not many people that would crawl out and be able to get out of what, what I came through. Um, and yet here I am today that I should set myself up as an example for other people to hopefully help them crawl out of their rock bottoms and give them some inspiration. So I start, I wrote my journal um, that I was just going to give to my kids for, for inspiration, build character to know that they were never going to have to go through this. Some other people read it, including Robert, and they thought it should be more than just a journal. Hmm. And I went out to a publisher and uh, several publishers, and one of them picked it up, and the rock bottom story got told. And so what I did with that is would use my story to speak to anybody who would listen, other businesses about business related to rock bottom, prisons, schools, um, universities, networking, business meetings, churches, um, just uh, anybody who wanted to listen to it, I would share, share the rock bottom story and I would learn incredible stories along the way. And at the same time, hopefully apply some inspiration to their lives and some of the things that I saw and, and have heard while I was doing that just drives me every day to say, this is why I do this. Because uh, Andres, there was a lot of risk with me writing a book at the time about rock bottom because I was the CEO of a multi-million dollar company and they knew, the owners of the company knew about my, my past, but only as far as I went back to school, got my business administration degree, they, I had great references from Action Systems and other companies. I had some success in the healthcare business. So they knew all that about my past, but they didn't know that I was a homeless guy who was in a gang, who was abused, who should have been dead several times. They didn't know that side of the story. So I shared it with them. But it, and so what happened is I risked millions by sharing that with them, and I did. 
So I felt more compelled at what it would do for people than, uh, than helping people than it did the money I might have made out of it. So I give away as many books as I sell, but in hopes of other people will take the story and carry it forward and create their own rock bottom streets of success story. And I've heard so many of them. It's just been a, um, it's just been a humbling, humbling experience. Um, and just the fact the incredible people I meet along the way, like you and I met and the things that we started together and the things that you've carried forward um, and just being inspired by people like you as well has, has really been, a, um, a life changer for me. And I'm just fortunate every day to be able to continue to move forward and, and help others out where I can. And, and Michael, for same, same to me. I mean, it's been inspiring in your story. I've shared it probably countless times in the hospital when so many of these kids, like, you know, when you say I should have been dead so many multiple times, I have five, six patients that I can think of right now that they should have been, they died pretty much. And they came back three or four times, resuscitated. Um, and a lot of times this is, they're putting this place for, because of addictions and trauma and just, I mean, you can name the reasons. It's a complex. And, um, and when I share your story, there is almost like this opening. It's like, you know, it's like when you turn the light in a room, it's like you can see what's around. You can see like a way out of this. You can see, well, it's like the four minute mile. You know, it's like, you know, nobody could run the funny mile until, until right. Bannister did it. And, 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 and so when I tell your story, I feel like it's the four minute mile. It's, it's, it's people can look that, look at your story and, and, and know that there is something better, that there is something to look forward to. Um, and so I tell your story all the time. And, uh, and, and going back to Robert Hall, uh, yeah. when, you know, it's an amazing story of, of like how one safe person can create so much progress. Do you think that, or do you think that you were ready at that point? Like when you took that decision, you were ready for that mentor? like how how or or like the mentor like you know when they say like the student when the student is ready the, the mentor is ready like what sort of work had you been done what sort of changes had you already been kind of doing leading up to a point if any i think um andres what i did was opened myself up to learning prior to i was so um i was so angry so defensive, so non-trusting of anybody that, that um, I would push people away. Like my own wife, I dated her for five years. I kept telling her she can do better than me. She can do better than me. And um, she wouldn't let me go. And Robert continued to trust and believe in me. And he would just sit back and do what he did as far as helping and inspiring people and leading people and building a business that uh, he just waited for me and I would slowly gravitate towards learning from him because I, I felt like I also felt like I wasn't smart enough that um, these people are highly educated. I was so intimidated. I was such an introvert. And, and he'll tell the story. So he, his book is, um, he wrote some, several books. One of them was called This Land of Strangers. This, it, this Land of Strangers? Land of Strangers by Robert E. Hall. And, and in this book, it's huge. It's, I forget, 400 plus pages. So it's an incredible book, but it's his lifelong work of his study of relationships. And that's what he was. He was some called him the godfather of relationships. And, and so he, he did studies from uh, each chapter was dedicated like relationships in politics, relationships in church, relationships internationally. You know, uh, he just went through all these different uh, marital relationships. 
You just did a study of all relationships and what's broken about them, how to fix them, things like that. Well, uh, chapter 13 of that book is dedicated to the relationship that I established with the company. And, and the funny thing was, is he did not, I did not know he was putting that in a book and he did not know I was writing a book to talk about him, but we did it separately and it came together in, in a really awesome way. So, so, the, so it was just being ready for the teaching and being open to it. So I'll speak to the prisons, for example, and I'll be in a maximum security prison and there'll be murderers or whatever. And I'll have 20 or 30 of, of the prisoners in there. And there may be, you know, armed guards above us and I'm speaking to them. And one of the things that, that, that they'll do sometimes is they'll share, you don't know what it's like to be hooked on drugs, to be, to be um, hooked on crack or hooked on heroin. And as opposed to a psychotherapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or somebody who studies it, a neuroscience, I mean, as opposed to them that, that they could say that to and they wouldn't know, I could look them square in the eyes and tell everybody in that room, there's not a drug that you have done that I have not done. So that excuse is gone because I've done it, I've been, I'm addictive compulsive, and I can be addicted to anything. Right now my weakness is ice cream, but I'm working on that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but again, I, so I can relate to them in a way, but then I can also speak, this example is amazing. I spoke to a group um, called the, um, uh, North Dallas uh, CEO NetWeavers group. And it was a group of about 75 senior executives, CEOs, CFOs, COOs, and so on that come together in Dallas for this really nice breakfast. And they have a keynote speaker and they brought me into keynote. And as I was speaking to them, I was telling them the story of what was going on. I told them about the story about being in the second grade and my stepmother, when I was going to visit my mom for the summer, my stepmom brought me and my brother in while my dad is work. She, she, we took our shirts off. She laid us on the bed and she whipped us, flogged us with a belt until these huge whelps rose up on our back. And then I told her about the switching. I told the group about the switching with the rose branch and, and all of that. And one of the female CEOs got up and said she was physically ill and disgusted that I didn't do anything about it. And, and how come I didn't stop and how come I let it go on? So when I agreed to start telling my story, the first thing I agreed to do was not judge the reaction. Whatever the reaction is, I would accept it. And, and, and some people got really visibly angry at her and actually somebody, another CFO stepped up and actually, you know, told a completely different story. But what I understood was this person who had probably gone to the best schools growing up, had a loving family, had an extended family, worked for the best companies and been wealthy. She had no idea of what people were going through, like what I went through. Right. So for me to share it at that level, the reason I did it is because I want those who have and don't deal with that to understand that this goes on so they can reach out. So they can reach out and help where they can help. And it was just incredible to go from prisons to CEOs and be able to articulate to CEOs what the, what the problem is with those who are struggling and be able to relate to drug addicts and alcoholics and criminals um, to what, no matter where you are at, I told them, you, some of you are never getting out, but contribute while you're here. Every one of you has a story. 
tell your story, write your story, do that, contribute. Um, so to be able to have that, being able to go again from the streets or crime to the boardroom, our CEOs, that to me was, you know, was something that I just felt that I had to do. So it's just been, been hmm. tremendous. And, and when you did, um, when you started, it's amazing that contribution is almost like the most empowering thing, you know, it's like, it's the empowering, like, oh, I, I can do something about this. And when you started seeing, like, I'm going to commit myself to this company, it gave you immense amount of power. And then it starts turning the universe to, and the people and to notice the, what you're doing. Uh, and what sort of skills do you think? Um, I guess my question was like when you decided to mail all these, um, you're saying, uh, the, the training materials, right? From the mail room, um, that was your job already or, or, or was it that you chose to stay like over time to do this thing? No. Because you so had a bigger I, impact. Yeah. So I was the production manager, right? At that time. I had somebody who now shipped materials. I had somebody else who printed the materials. I had somebody else who word processed the materials. And I had somebody else who, who edited the materials. And so we had these, these materials, right, that were put together. And everybody else at 5 o'clock on Friday went home and they were done. Um, I didn't say anything. I just knew we could ship these materials. And, and so I just stayed myself behind to physically put the materials together, pack the boxes, get to FedEx, ship all the materials, and get them there by Monday so we could bill it to make payroll. And you knew about payroll because you were already the, the, the production. Uh, the that, and I heard from finance, accounting, and our company that we weren't going to be able to make payroll unless we did something pretty dramatic. Gotcha. 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 That, that, ha that, and, that, and how, when you got promoted the first time, what happened? How was that? Well, most of the time it was out of a combination of earning it and necessity. So remember we had cut down to a really small company. So as we started building back up, uh, we didn't have people in those roles. So they, they would give me the role of production supervisor to production manager or whatever, because, and then what I'd have to do is as we grew, I'd have to backfill all of those positions, editors, word processors, print shop, and all that, that we didn't have that. I was physically doing a lot of it, but we'd have like one or two people doing it. And then we ended up having, 12 or 15 people. The other thing I did with the staff um, that helped us financially was we had four or five editors. We had four, we have no, probably six or seven processors. We had a couple people in print shop, a couple people in shipping. And I cross-trained everybody as an initiative. So when times got tough, we would have the right number of people that could do all the jobs in case we'd lose people, we wouldn't replace them. And we could do more with less because they were cross-trained versus all of them being trained just for that one job. So that helped us financially as well. And what, and, and, and so, and then from there, what was the next skill set that you think was necessary for you to graduate that level of cross-training, managing, starting to manage people, and then when you went to the next level, what was the skill set you think that you got? Yeah, so what, what, so it's a great, another great question, Andres, and it, it ties into what the next steps for me. Uh, what I had to do next, Andres, is take care of myself. Remember, I was uneducated. I could barely spell my name. I had speech impediments. Um, I had a southern drawl for whatever that's for. Um, so I had, I had, several things and so one of the things that robert and the company educated me on was take your head out of the sports page for a little bit and start looking at the wall street journal um why not give it a shot and go back to school and so 
I would work until five or six, and then I would go to classes at a college down the street uh, from six, 6.30 to 10 o'clock at night. And then on the weekends, instead of out partying like I used to do, I was studying and uh, doing homework and things like that. And so what happened was I started uh, getting certified in, in um, administrative management. I started getting my business administration degree. I started taking special classes and seminars and conferences on, on leadership and, and trying to grow. I was really embracing it. Um, and here's the deal, Andreas, I tell this to people, the young kids, especially that they don't know what they want to do. I said, I still don't know what I want to do. And, 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 but at the end of the day, one of the things I, I did know is the, that, that I wanted to be a part of leadership. I wanted to learn and grow and I wanted to help other people, but I didn't know where I wanted to do it. So I've now applied this skill in banking and financials. I've applied it in records management. I provided it in healthcare. Um, I provided it in telehealth. Um, so the experience that I got, it wasn't the industry um, that, I, that I was concerned about. It was how I get experience to be able to diversify and go into different industries and apply it. And that's what I really like is the diversity of being able to go to different companies and put my skill set to use. <laughs> and it's almost like that next level of being able to have the skill set. I guess when you're saying that, uh, that when you were, you know, moving forward, you were able to, to start um, developing the system and taking care of yourself, really. Like working on your skill set and your psychology to be able to expand uh, and actually learn what it takes to run a company, what it takes to, and was that same skill set that it took for you to graduate, I guess, graduate until the next, for the next step into now becoming CEO of companies or what sort of other sort of skill set did you have to gain? Yeah. So, um, you know, th there's, there's probably to, something to be looked at there, but it, it did require some education that limited me that I didn't get an advanced degree or, or a PhD or anything like that of what, what I, what I could have went on to do. Um, however, the, you know, the, the, the learning aspect of the education plus the, um, the job and and people would train me and I'd grow to that next level and opportunities would come. And, but the real key and maybe the question being asked is how do, how do I go from that to being a CEO of a company? Right. I mean, where something has to happen or click differently that because there's a lot of people that climb up from the streets and get a good job and things like that. Correct. But to, be a CEO of a company or to be, or to lead 2000 employees or, or, or whatever in that regard, that really took a lot. And it, it just was growing. It's just something that grow in me. I was so afraid to speak publicly, um, to have my voice heard. And uh, I really had to force that. And I slipped up all the time. I stuttered. I, I did, the words didn't come out right. I embarrassed myself and all that, but I could not let it go. And so to, today I've spoken to groups of 2000 business leaders and large churches and, and just the, 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 the message is there's something driven in me. And I almost called the, um, the book refuse to fail because that's what I had to, the mindset I had to take. I was going to refuse to fail no matter what it was, whether it was meeting that payroll, whether it was uh, not letting a company fail, you know, whether it was getting up in front of a bunch of people, whether it was being interviewed on Fox TV or something, you know, those things can be unnerving. Um, but I just had to get the mindset and, and the, Biggest key, I think, to success in any of those areas, and sometimes I'm good at it, sometimes I'm not, is um, preparing. Just 
prepare for. If you're preparing for a career, if you're preparing for a test, if you're preparing for a new job, if you're preparing for a new opportunity, just be prepared and, and know your, your subject, you know, your job or whatever. And so the, the people ask you, how can you get in front of all these people? Aren't you so nervous? And I said, again, at the end of the day, I try to be prepared. And there's one subject I know that I talk about, and that's me. So if I'm up there talking about myself, I should know that subject really well, and I should prepare and be ready. Um, so, uh, so it's just to know your subject, know what you want, and then de devise a plan to go after it. If we were looking back at a, at a, at a movie of, of, of this life, of your life, what was a point in there that we would be like, wow, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the all the, so this is the harder thing for me, Andreas, is, you know, some people look and when they really see me live in person telling this story, you know, the, the emotions it evokes, because I really try to um, tell the story in a way that brings up raw new nerves for everybody. But then at the same time, it, it, I put it to a point how it uplifts. And the biggest thing I get concerned about when I share my story is that people feel sorry for me or sympathetic or, or to my situation in my past. And that to me is the worst, the worst thing I could do because I want people to know I'm the luckiest man alive. And I've got the most incredible life I enjoy every day uh, being able to wake up and enjoy a morning and, and when I thought I should have been dead years ago. And so, um, so, so from a, if something turned out to be in a movie and, you know, our documentary, which is another thing that's come up is that um, if it, if there was a vehicle like that, that would get the story out in a way that would help others. When you see what is out on TV today and what people are dealing with today and the kind of movies that are coming out, um, I would love for an inspirational story um, to really be raw, uh, but have the most incredible ending that ends up with being able to take the story and use it to help person after person. Hmm. Um, and, and there are stories I heard that people had never told anybody before, but because I stood out there and openly shared my story with people, they felt compelled to share things that they'd never share with anybody. And I mean, it breaks me down to hear some of the stories that I heard but it also compels me to say, this is why I do this because people know who don't have a voice can have some outreach to it and maybe even tell their own story in the future. And what's the most satisfying thing about being a CEO now? So, or to, you know, being the C level suite and leading so many people. Yeah, so that's the thing, right? It's, you know, there, there's all the things that I don't necessarily like about it, but the thing I like about it is, remember I talked about Robert being that mentor for me. I think mentors are critical mm -hmm. part of people's success. And you can be 16 or you can be 56, right? Um, and everybody can grow from a good mentor. I just appreciate the opportunity to now take everything that I've learned throughout my entire life and reach a point where I can mentor others, where they can't hit me with a curveball when I have frontline employees that are working paycheck to paycheck, single families with their own history of rock bottom. And I can relate to what they're dealing with and help them walk them through it and encourage them to get back on their feet or an executive who's dealing with some tragedy or some darkness or things behind the scenes that they've never shared with anybody that they hear my story and they can share. That's what's the satisfying thing about this role is being able to help people 
and and just and so through my story i've been able to do that and so whether it be in the company or when i speak or when i share the story and i can see how it's helped people or have people follow up with me like i'll speak to schools and i'll get tons of letters or emails about the story and personally how it affected them mm -hmm way that 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 I say okay this is why I'm on this earth and I'm glad to be able to do it hmm. and do you think that like you know in the medical field the addictions are such a big part of, of of everything you know do you think that in a sort of way we can control it or do you think that it just life kind of maybe takes us into a a place where we get hit so hard that awareness and consciousness comes into this issue? Um, or do you think that we have an ability to bring upon this consciousness that this is an issue and change it? And then what does it take to live behind an addiction? Yeah, I think it's, um, so I think another great question, Andreas, but I think it's, the one thing is, I can't fix addiction. I can't fix an addict or I can't fix somebody who is an addict. I think experts who do that, I think they can even struggle with that because they can't relate to an addict. Absolutely, right? man. At the same time, I might be able to relate to an addict, but I don't have the clinical experience to help. If you could combine the two, right, which is probably maybe a direction I should have went, but if, if we, we could combine the two and partner, where you have people who have been there and done that. There's people like Chris Heron who has been there and done that and had to deal with it. There are a lot of people out there who have dealt with that. And if you combine that with clinical expertise, I think you can really go a long way with making a difference. And then what you do is you pay it forward. You create these people that come out of it and then they use their story in their past and partner with clinical expertise and collectively they, they address it together. I think that'd be an incredible approach to it um, because I know one thing I've seen people die from it. I've, I've seen level of death um, from addiction. Um, again, if you know my story, my mom died from it. My sister died from it. My stepbrother died from it. And in, into a sense, my other stepbrother died from it as well. But you know, I, I write at the back of the book an epilogue of what happened to all of my family. Some of them went on to do very well, like my brother who had three car dealerships and, and has owned um, apartments and things like that. So he did very well coming out of it. I have another brother who became a Baptist minister and uh, he does very well, with, you know, where our, my calling wasn't to the pulpit, he took his story of rock bottom and he took it to the pulpit and it, and he's been doing this for years, helping teens and, and everything find their way um, through, uh, through faith. And so, so the fact, so there's different ways that you can be used to do this. I think this is where I was called to do it. So, but to back to your point, I don't know, that I'm not going to get out in front and say that I'm going to solve addiction. Um, but I see it being a challenge where people fall off the wagon all the time because I get involved with people who are going through um, getting, getting help. And then as soon as they're done with the program, they're back at it. Right. Right. Got to impact them so much that there's no way they want to go back. And that's right. kind of what yeah, and I think it's almost like that, that something to look forward to is like you were, you were creating this new future that was so much more compelling than that other one and you felt capable of achieving it and you had the mentorship to, you know, you felt that supported, right? Yeah, I had somebody there that loved and cared for me unconditionally. I never had that growing up. Yeah. They have had that growing up and the other thing that i would say to people that not only something to look forward to but also to accept you're going to fall down yeah, yeah. you're going you're going to slip up it's not going to be perfect 
but you've got to refuse to fail because when you do, you reach a place like this where you're like, my gosh, this is why I'm on this earth. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you find your purpose, um, all bets are off for the future because it's yours to take hold of and, and, and just really, really give back. I mean, I think the, the quote is, you know, it's, it's not what you do on this earth, but you know, who you help on this earth that makes a difference and makes a life. Yeah. And whether it be your kids, um, or, or hundreds of thousands of people over time. So I'm, uh, I just, whether this is where I'm supposed to be or not, it feels really good right now. And so that's uh, I'm, awesome. I'm sitting here right now talking to you. Um, and, and I can't think of a better place I want to be. That's awesome, Michael. And what's next for you? So if, if I have my, um, my dream scenario, I would love to be able to take this story and write a version two, the next version of the book, which would in, which would include, so the story of rock bottom, I'm just revealing too much for anybody. You don't have to read the book now, but, uh, Rock bottom, the feedback I received is about the story itself is, is you know, you know it's, it's incredible or whatever. But at the end of the day, it talks about what happened to me, but it didn't go through the steps I took to climb out of it. And I'd love to read a story about how you took your rock bottom and the actual, just kind of like you were alluding to, the actual steps you took to climb out of rock bottom to be where you're at today. And that's what I wanted a second book to cover. And then honestly, I'm at a point where I'd love to, to do this full time, to go, to go across the country and speak to people and share the stories and create the, the steps that, it, that it took together and then even help people at another, another level. So hmm. that would be, scenario but i still have a kid in college so i still gotta have a job and all of that but um but the, yeah if if i was going to do um, what's next for me that's what i'd be working on wow that's awesome mike yeah and it's so crazy because in my mind that's so true like that like that's amazing what you've done and it's like the rock up or something you know it's like yeah. it's like, <laughs> like well because you've done so much and you've led so many people and you've impacted so many lives that it's like, wow, how did he do it? You know, how did he do that? Like, so I think it would be an amazing book. And I mean, I can't wait to read it, you know? So that's awesome to hear. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, you know, so, I, so I've been working on it, but it's more like a journal and a life work. And, you know, when you put something like that into it, uh, when I wrote Rob Bottom, I, again, the publisher only accepted a certain amount of words in your first right. book. So right. There was a lot left on the table that I wanted to pull forward. And I wanted to fold some of this into the, the, the message and the how to part of it. So who knows what the future will hold. Wow. That's awesome, Mike. Well, it was awesome talking to you. We're, we've done an hour and 18 minutes. And so it was every one of those minutes were great. So I appreciate your time. So what do you do? You cut it down to five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We don't. No editing. So this will be in there full. So, Well, seriously, thank you so much. And again, we could go on all day about everything that you're doing as well, including this podcast. I never seem to be, um, I'm just never cease to be amazed by next time, the, every time we talk, you seem to be doing something uh, incredible that I wasn't expecting. So thank you so much for for that. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it, Michael. Thank you. All right.